Again, The Last Day by Margaret Scott Darcy. It has been a long day, and these clearance meetings are never any fun, especially not in the heat of the airless boardroom. But the other members of the audit team argue on, and not for the first time, she looks through the floor-to-ceiling glass windows in the International Financial Services Centre and wishes she could take a flying leap out into the sparkling waters of Dublin Bay. She remembers the cool, airy offices of their Wall Street branch, the thought of another day wasted on this assignment. A soft knock at the door. A man in blue overalls enters with a large portable fan and goes to the corner of the room and plugs it in. She decides to take advantage of the temporary lull in the discussion. OK, guys, back to what I was saying. If I might just run through my figures one more time, she continues. I think James is right. I think if we just reverse... Her accent is a strange mixture of New York and something else. Put, 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 put. The fan stutters to life in the corner. I hear it in the distance as I wake. The put, 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 put sound. The American Marines are on the move again. Put, 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 put. She can feel a bead of sweat on her hairline. She cannot believe this is happening again. All eyes are on her as she tries to work her way through the report. She thinks about gesturing to James to turn off the fan, but she knows from old that it is too late. The damage has been done. And once the beast has been woken, there is nowhere to hide. It is early, and dawn has only just started to creep over the long grasses that mark the eastern boundary of the village. It is market day, but we were told yesterday that the market has been cancelled this week because of the recent trouble with the troops. I do not care. Now I can spend my birthday playing in the hamlet with my brother, Mi Min, instead of minding chickens at the busy stall. The early sunlight dances through the woven roof, and I look over to where Mi Min sleeps peacefully, his spidery black lashes flickering against his soft skin. He is only four, but I decide I will still play with him, even though I am now seven. I look around the hut. Mama is already gone to bring the oxen to the water. And, of course, Papa is not here. There are no men like Papa in the village anymore. Just us children, our mothers and grandparents. After reaching to wake me in, I crawl out of my bed and look out towards the horizon. Against the crimson sky, like a giant black insect, a helicopter hovers. A black silken head appears beside me, Mi Min rubs his eyes. He is mesmerized by the helicopter, but then he is only four. They are nothing new when you are seven. She takes another deep breath and continues to speak. Her pitch a shade higher than normal, her usual measured tones altered slightly as she deftly sets out the solution to their problem. Then I hear a different noise. A sharper tack, 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 followed by screams of no VC, no VC. The noises are coming from the northern end of the village. I pull me in close, but he just looks up, his dark eyes not yet afraid. Tack, 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 tack. More screams, but closer. I see a plume of smoke rise up to the sky. They are burning the houses. I run to wake Grandma and Grandpa, but they are already awake. Grandpa runs from our hut to see what is wrong. I see Mama run from the far end of the village, pulling the stubborn white oxen behind her. But as I watch, 
shots ring out, and the oxen falls clumsily to the ground. Mama screams and starts to run. There's a sharp crack, then she too falls. I go to run to her, but Grandma holds me back, her bony fingers stronger than I could have imagined. They start to round us up. Grandma, Mi Min, and I are hustled into a group on the green in the center of the village. There is no sign of Grandpa. All around us the air is thick with smoke, as the thatched huts are set on fire by the American soldiers. Gunfire crackles the air, and I put my hands over my brother's ears and shield his eyes with my dress. She knows now that they have noticed. Their looks have changed from admiration to puzzlement. She can feel the rivulets of sweat course down her forehead and fall from her chin down onto the manila folder in front of her. Panicking, she looks at James, but even he, her closest colleague, is looking at her in bewildered concern, unsure of what to do. She stumbles from the table towards the door, but she cannot see where it is. She falls to the floor. She starts to moan and rocks with grief as it plays, continuous and unstoppable in her head. The Americans are shouting at us now. Grandma says they must be looking for Viet Cong, but they will not find any. We hide none in the village. But they do not understand us any more than we understand them. We are under the guard of two of their soldiers while they search. But when they find nothing, they become angrier. The one in charge starts to shout at the others and then turns to us. His eyes are wild and enraged. He raises his gun. Beginning at one end of our group, he starts to shoot, and we fall like the oxen. Mi Min screams and breaks from my arms. He tries to run back towards our hut. The soldier turns and puts two bullets in his back. I scream and scream, but I do not hear any sound. Grandma grabs me and puts me behind her. And when the soldier turns to finish off our group, she falls on top of me, her lifeless body pinning me down. She moans again and mutters and protests in a tongue that she has not used for many years now. No longer a middle-aged accountant, but that little girl of many years ago. And she tears and scratches at her head, trying to get the images to go away. Put, put, put. How long I lie here, I don't know. I can only hear what happens next. The helicopters return with more soldiers, but now the gunfire stopping. The new soldiers are angry too. I can hear them getting closer. I cannot take it any more. The scream that I have held inside me for so long reaches my lips, and I cannot stop. I cannot stop. I wail and scream, scream and cry. I feel them move the body of my grandmother from over me, and I prepare for death. But the soldier that looks at me, looks down at me, then lifts me from the tangle of corpses. He carries me to the helicopter. A handful of injured villagers crouch in terror. The noise of the machine is thunderous, terrifying, not the putt-putt we have heard many times in the distance. Thunderous, terrifying. The force of its giant blades whips my hair into my eyes. We start to rise, rise into the sky, and the last thing I see through the smoke and flames of the burning village of Mi Lai are two crumpled and blood-spattered white oxen. Now it is over. She is once more aware of her surroundings, of a strong pair of hands that clasp her tightly, binding her arms to her sides to stop their thrashing. She looks up, but for a moment all she can see is the face of that American soldier as he helps her to her feet. 
post-traumatic stress disorder, they called it. It used to happen much more often, but even now, despite the therapy, anything could set it off. A loud noise, the sight of a child's coat strewn on the grass, a TV news headline. Its sequence was the same every time. Every single time. Every single time, and it would never change the minute-by-minute rerun of that day. Back in New York, her colleagues assumed it was some kind of fit, epilepsy, they whispered to each other, and it had been a rumour she was happy to let circulate. Now it had happened here in Dublin, and from the horrified looks on the faces of her colleagues, she knew it would not take long now for the rumours to start again. She straightens her shoulders, and as the soldier's face disappears, she sees that it is James that supports her, guiding her towards the door. But as she takes each shaky step, the smell of death still lingers. She can still taste the acrid smoke of gunfire. She should have been celebrating her seventh birthday on March the 16th, 1968. Instead, she would always remember it as the last day of her life. The My Lai Massacre was committed by US soldiers against hundreds of unarmed Vietnamese civilians, mostly women and children, on March 16, 1968, during the Vietnam War. Photographs provoked a world outcry and the incident became an international scandal. As one of the worst US war crimes, it prompted widespread outrage and reduced public support for the war in the United States. The platoon was led by Lieutenant William Calley, who was later court-martialed for murder. <laughs> 